Hello YA fantasy and adventure fans, and welcome to Brielle D. Porter's Jester. My name is Kayla, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. I'll be introducing you to each episode of Brielle D. Porter's Jester. The story follows magician Lizette, whose father killed the king. His execution leaves Lizette alone, disgraced, and without the magic he intended to pass on to her. Desperate to survive in a city glutted with power, Lizette enters into a deadly competition. If she wins, she'll become the highest ranked performer in the world, the Queen's Jester. If she loses, it may be off with her head. This unputdownable book will whisk you away to a fantastical world of magic and fun mixed with a little bit of competition and mystery. It's a book to live in. If you find yourself loving this book as much as we do, CamCat Unwrapped is hosting a giveaway this week where one lucky winner will receive the full audiobook of Jester for free. All you have to do to enter is subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, or newsletter and answer a quick survey all of which are linked in our bio. Each new subscription is one entry, so make sure you enter for your chance to win this book to live in. Enjoy! If you don't want to miss a beat, listen to Jester now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. The first two episodes of every book can always be found on Camcat Unwrapped but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. So subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped, and if you love this story, you can support the author by buying their audiobook. The story starts with Lizette attempting to get the attention of the queen by performing a daring magic trick. There's just one problem. Lizette doesn't have magic and must resort to parlor tricks and illusions to enthrall her audience. Just when she has captivated her audience, her show is interrupted by an irritating rival with some insidious information about her past. Cam Cat Publishing presents Jester by Brielle Porter. Narrated by Reba Burr. To Johnny. I know we don't believe in soulmates, but baby, you're mine. Chapter 1 A group of tourists has gathered to watch me throw knives at a shop boy. They've come here for magic. I've kept them here with misdirection and lies. Maybe it's not magic exactly, but it is undeniably entertaining watching my unwilling assistant flinch every time the knife point gets too close to his groin. I hold the knife steady, aiming watching his limp hair flop as the wooden wheel he's strapped to slowly rotates. Stefan lets out a whimper, and I toss him a smile. He was a lot braver in the shop where I'd found him, flirting as he bagged my books. It hadn't been hard to trick him into volunteering. The crowd jeers. Aim lower. Aim higher. Maim his ugly face. Throw three at once. Mirage, don't you dare. Stefan shouts. The nighttime crowd is always hungrier for violence. I hold up my hands placatingly. Obviously, I can't throw three knives at once. That would be dangerous and highly irresponsible. There are a couple of groans, but my reputation must precede me because there are a few whoops and chuckles thrown in as well. With a sweep, I pull my deadliest knife from my belt, the one with the wicked serrated edge brandishing it for the crowd. But I think we can spice things up a bit. I stab the knife into a vat of oil, the shimmering liquid sliding down the tang of the blade. Then, with a flourish, I sweep it through a nearby torch. Flame devours the knife. The crowd roars its approval. Stefan pales. The hilt burns in my hand, throwing off sparks, as I wonder if perhaps I've gone too far. I've only tried this a few times, and the jackrabbit I had caught to practice with wasn't even good to eat after, blackened to an inedible crisp. Either way, I'll give them a show. Even though the knife feels like it's blistering my palm, I take a moment to pan the audience. 
This is always my favorite part. The tension is a palpable thing, visible in held gasps, wide eyes, and awe. Magic. And that's when I see him, expression carefully neutral, almost bored, one eyebrow raised, arms folded across a suit that costs more than my father made in a year. A seeker. My heart pounds as I realize more than Stefan's crotch is at stake here now. If I nail this, that pretentious clown in a suit has the power to get my act in front of the queen. I could be the next jester. It's the reason I've come here tonight. The same reason I've performed for thousands of crowds like this one. Sucking in a breath, I hold the knife level. Stefan thrashes, but the binding's pinning him to the wheel like a dead butterfly hold. Right as I pull back to throw, there's a shout. King killer! The knife slips in my grip, but it's too late. I watch, horrified, as the blade wobbles in the air, the trajectory off. It clatters to the ground a few feet away from Stefan, flames smothered in the dirt. There's a moment of shocked silence, as though the crowd is waiting for me to do something. Make a joke, throw another knife, something. I can still save this. Even Stefan gops at me as I stare unseeing at the crowd. But I don't do anything. I just stand there, the word pounding in my head over and over. King killer. Even real magic couldn't save me now. It couldn't save my father, traitor to the throne and murderer of the king. Not that I have magic anyway, as my father's magic died with him when they executed him for treason. Leaving my family disgraced, leaving me to peddle illusion in a cheap imitation of the real thing. The seeker is gone. I watch him leave, head shaking as if disappointed. The crowd swallowing him up again. My one big shot, gone as quickly as the smoke from my act. I gather up my knives, suddenly too exhausted to even finish the show. There are a few shouted threats, but I hardly notice through the fog of disappointment. I can't believe it's over. 17 months I've waited for the opportunity to impress a seeker, and with just one word, it's over. And I didn't even make enough gold dust to buy myself dinner. I loosen Stefan's bindings, my fingers slipping as a loud gasp from the nearby crowd steals my attention. Stefan drops with a thud and a curse, but I hardly hear his complaints. Most of my audience has wandered off, inflating the already bloated numbers of the show next to mine. The entire stretch of street, known fondly to those in the business as the noose, is filled with performers clamoring to be seen. Nowhere else in the kingdom of Terica is there a place so glutted with magic. Everything from the mundane enchantments like the ones used to keep the hotels refreshingly cool inside, even here in the desert, to the spectacular. Sandwiched between the most impressive hotels in Oasis, including the impressive Crown Hotel, the noose is one of the best spots to snag wealthy patrons with too much gold in their wallets and too much liquor in their blood. A bolt of lightning so bright it leaves a streak in my vision cracks the pavement several feet away. Applause and gold nuggets are thrown at the magician, who bows. Ignoring Stefan's shouts, I wander over to see what has the tourists so hot. I've seen most of the shows in the noose multiple times. After all, I've got to maintain a healthy edge over my competitors. So I'm not surprised when I recognize the performer instantly. His name rises in my throat like bile. Luke. Long, blonde hair swept into a knot on top of his head, and with a jawline that could cut glass. Luke is one of the most popular acts on the noose besides my own. Even with his face arranged in an arrogant sneer, he's still irritatingly handsome. A simple flourish of his long red coat sparks deafening applause. The crowds love him, and he knows it. His gaze sweeps the crowd greedily, sucking in the cheers as though they physically sustain him. I know the feeling well. I jolt when his eyes land on me, pick me out in the crowd. I want to shrink, to disappear, the same caught feeling as a mouse in the gaze of a hawk. Can I have a volunteer, please? The hand of every eligible woman in the crowd shoots up. 
He grins, cocky, surveying the desperate volunteers. He raises an eyebrow at me, intention clear. I cross my arms, unwilling to give him the satisfaction of a reaction. With a disappointed shake of his head so slight I could have imagined it, he selects a different young woman. Even from where I stand near the back of the crowd, it's obvious she is heartbreakingly lovely and fantastically wealthy. Luke's smile broadens as he helps her on stage. Flowing blonde hair, full lips, flushed cheeks, and a garnet necklace like a collar of blood against her pale throat. I roll my eyes. Luke definitely has a type. He takes her hand gently and leans in to whisper something in her ear. She titters, cheeks rosy. She's clearly enraptured, unaware of the fate that awaits her, a butterfly in a web. Even if she did know, I doubt she'd care. Half the women in this audience have seen Luke's show before, and in spite of its macabre ending, they still keep coming in droves. He ignores her fluttering lashes, his eyes finding me again in the crowd. A chill runs down my spine. Without breaking eye contact, he stabs the girl on stage. And even though I've seen his show hundreds of times, know exactly how it ends. A gasp breaks free from my tight lips as she crumples to the ground. Blood stains the wood around her, a stage that has seen its fair share of death. Seeing my reaction, he actually has the nerve to smile as she bleeds out on the ground beside him. He steps away from the blood before it can reach his expensive snakeskin boots, ignoring the paunchy man who clambers on stage with him, pawing frantically at the bloody maiden. Olivia, what have you done to her? Olivia, wake up! Olivia's father, I assume, if his age and resemblance to the girl are any indicator. Luke smiles down benevolently at the man whose face is blotchy and panicked. Tears run down his cheek as he blubbers, and my gut clenches both in shame for him and pity. Who will pay the debt for this maiden? Luke asks. He doesn't extend a hand to the man who grasps at his trousers, unaware of the blood that stains his fine clothes. I will, the man cries, wiping the snot from his face. Please, I'll do anything, just bring back my daughter. Luke has chosen wisely. It's obvious this man will pay anything for his jewel of a daughter. Luke eyes him as though weighing a handful of gold dust, and then glances at the ropes of garnets choking the woman's fragile neck. The desperate father seizes upon his meaning, and with shaking fingers unclasps the heavy necklace and passes it to Luke. Holding it up for the crowd first, Luke pockets the jewels with a satisfied smile. The debt has been paid. Arise, fair maiden. For a moment, nothing happens. Everyone's eyes are on the girl, whose lips have turned a faint blue. But my eyes are on Luke. I can see the strain as he tries to bring her back from beyond. The sweat that runs, neglected, down his temple. The clenched fists. Watching for any kind of rise in her lungs, but they stay still. I've only seen Luke fail once. That girl's family was desolate but could do nothing. Because that's what these wealthy fools come here for. To be thrilled. To be entertained no matter the cost. And Luke never fails to give them a show. Heart pounding. I watch Luke cross the stage, jaw tight. To anyone else, he looks collected, but I can see the way his teeth grind. She's not coming back, I think. And before I can register the thought, Luke lifts the dead girl up and kisses her passionately. The man, her father, I remember numbly, lets out a startled cluck like a chicken on a chopping block. For a minute, it's deathly silent. Then the girl gasps for air hands scrabbling at Luke's neck. I let out a gust of air, then feel my lungs inflate as hers do. Luke bows to riotous applause as gold nuggets rain on the stage. No one sees the girl, whose lips are still blue, whose lungs struggle to reset, her father crying into her hair. She'll likely suffer brain damage, being without oxygen for as long as she was. That's the price of magic, true magic. Luke's show is cruel but effective. There's a reason he's known on the noose as the devil. Sell him your soul, 
and he'll give you a show. And although I'm loath to admit it, he's my biggest competition for the position of jester. Sure enough, not one but two seekers have joined him on stage. I watch as they fight for his attention, eager to claim the commission that comes with finding a worthy act. As though he can feel my eyes on him, Luke lifts his gaze from the seekers. I can read the words on his lips as clearly as if he spoke. King Killer. Chapter Two I whirl away, the anger so hot I can feel it pounding in my blood. How did that idiot find out about my father? For not the first time in my life, I curse my father for his murderous impulses. I don't care if he killed the king, but I do care that he left me alone, disgraced, the daughter of a traitor and without magic. There's no point in performing my last show of the evening now, not after Luke reminded half the noose of my father's wretched legacy. I reach the doors to the shipwreck. I grasp for the mother of pearl inlaid handle, ignoring the valet rushing to open it for me. The hotel is nothing short of magnificent, despite the name. Marble floors gleam. Everywhere, jeweled sea life frolics, creeps, and slithers. The opulent chandelier is even a pearl and diamond jellyfish, long tentacles swaying. But the true jewel of the shipwreck is the huge wall-to-wall -wall aquarium, which boasts a large array of sharks, a shy cave octopus, and mermaids. The mermaids aren't real, of course. Like everything else here, they're a carefully crafted illusion. Not truly sirens of the deep, but showgirls wearing fake tails, spelled to breathe underwater. Even knowing that, I find myself captivated. Their long, powerful tails flash as they swim elegantly through clouds of jellyfish. They are nude on top, only the barest sprinkling of glitter. One of the mermaids catches my eye through the glass, long azure hair floating, framing her heart-shaped face. I notice her eyes are bloodshot, no doubt from hours of exposure to tank water and exhaustion. The sympathy in her gaze shakes me as if from a dream. Turning away from the mermaids, I make my way to the front desk, Praying Bale, manager of the shipwreck, is off duty. Unfortunately for me, I haven't had good luck for longer than I can remember, so I steel myself for the worst. But the woman at the desk is new, dark hair pulled back into a shining clamshell clip and a worried look on her pretty face. I force a haughty expression, the kind most of the patrons here are wearing, and slam my hand on the heavy gold bell, even though she's right in front of me. She jumps and eyes me, taking in my worn and filthy costume and unkempt hair. I'd like to check into my suite early, I say, drumming my fingers on the gleaming countertop, scanning the room as if everything in it displeases me. Still, the receptionist hesitates, not buying either my look or my tone. Time to seal the deal. After suffering a wretched bout of motion sickness through the canyon, I certainly hope your establishment proves itself worthy of my husband, John Ellington's patronage. This gets her attention. Of course, madam, we've been expecting you both. I cover my mouth as if yawning, hiding the relief that gusts out of me. The name was a crapshoot. John Ellington, oil baron and notorious gambling addict, visits Oasis often and always seems to have a reserved room. Thanks to the many holes pockmarking the desert from his drills, he has neither a shortage of gold nor new wives. She riffles through the guest book and scratches a neat check mark next to John Ellington's name. I watch, hardly daring to breathe, as she pulls two tiny brass keys from a drawer. Just as she reaches to hand them to me, a shout turns my blood to ice. I turn, groaning inwardly as a short, sweaty man makes his way across the shining floors. Even in a hurry, he keeps his head high, as if to belie the fact that he physically can't look down on anyone, not even me. Hello, Bale, I say, resigned, when he finally reaches the desk. He daubs at his high forehead with an intricately embroidered handkerchief. Even Bale's sweat is worth more than I am. Elizabeth, darling, 
he begins once he's caught his breath. This girl has a lifetime ban from the shipwreck. Come on, Bale, I break in as Elizabeth's gaze darts in my direction in shock. I can't believe you made it past the valets, he mutters, wiping his brow again. What's the story this time, Mirage? Traveling royalty, a lady in waiting sent early to prepare the queen's rooms. She said she was the wife of Mr. Ellington, sir, Elizabeth says, twin points of red on her cheeks. I curtsy. Oh, of course, Bale says, shaking his head. Get out of my hotel. Please, Bale, I say, hating the pleading tone that's crept into my voice. I'd really prefer to do this the easy way tonight. I'll give you all the dust I make tomorrow. It's a lie, and we both know it. Shoo, he repeats, stubborn. Out of the corner of my eye, I see one of the guards glide in. To anyone else, he's just a very big, well-dressed man. But I see the copper stains on one cuff, the one that he self-consciously folds into his suit sleeve. Bale is clearly not going to change his mind, so I make my way to the doors, shame curdling in my stomach. I'm so focused on the floor, I almost run head first into another patron. Watch it, I cry. Begging your pardon, madam, the patron says, smirking. And that's when I realize I know him. Tall, lithe frame, cloaked all in red. Luke. Get out of my way, I snap, but he just stands there, barring the door. A heavy gold snake winds its way across his shoulders, a scaled stole. I ignore the way its slitted eyes follow my every move. I didn't know you were married, Luke says, a lazy smile on his lips. And to John Ellington, no less. That makes you his fifth wife in six months. Lucky man. So he saw everything then. Move before I disembowel you, I say, meeting his arrogant gaze, making sure he sees the glint of the knife in my hand. Such a lady, he chuckles. How did you like my show? Getting a bit predictable, I bite out, finally shoving past him. To my great annoyance, he follows me out into the street. We can't all be wizards with a knife, can we? He calls after me. Pity you can't do any real magic, though. I whip around to face him, pleased when he almost stumbles. Even so... I did notice you still had to resort to name calling to steal away my audience, I say, trying not to wince when the snake lets out a low hiss. Luke strokes the snake on his shoulder, enjoying my evident disgust. I'll be honest, not my finest moment, but it worked better than I could have imagined. Headliner at the Panther now, thanks to you. I scowl. That should have been me. Soon to be Jester. He murmurs near my ear, and it's then I realize how close he is. The snake on his shoulder sways, half its body suspended in the air. I stumble backward quickly as I realize it's bridging the gap between us. Oh, I do apologize, Luke says, letting the snake slide down his arm and twine around his fingers. Do you not like my snake? I have no interest whatsoever in your snake. I reply scathingly. Shame, he says, white teeth glinting. I turn away, disgusted. Come now, Lisette, don't be like that. I'm only teasing. I freeze at the mention of my name, my real name, not the stage name I don like a mask. I whirl around, but he's gone, nothing to indicate he was even there, other than a few wisps of smoke and the smell of oranges. I always swear that I won't come back, but each night will be my last. And yet, every twilight finds me here again, returned like a dog to its vomit. The place certainly smells like vomit. I wrinkle my nose against the assortment of foul odors assaulting my senses. Cheap alcohol, the spicy musk of body odor and bad breath, years of mold. I'm fairly certain that if despair had a smell, this would be it. I peel off my noose costume regretfully. Black corset, black cape with embroidered gold stars in the lining, 
black trousers that lace up the sides, black boots. It's a simple outfit compared to Luke's, but I like to think my show stands on its own. Trading one disguise for another, I fold my clothes neatly, careful to ensure nothing comes in contact with the grimy vanity or stained carpets. The server getup, like everything else in the Bird of Paradise Casino, is gaudy. Bright, unnaturally colored feathers adorn the corset, which is sequined, and the headdress, which is heavy. Fake gold bangles, chipped and worn, line my wrists and arms. The headdress is studded with large plastic jewels. I eye the faux gemstones balefully. Once upon a time, the jewels I wore were real. Everything was real. Once. I cringe as I slide on the bottom half of the costume, little more than a pair of panties adorned with a sweeping tail of feathers. Half the feathers are missing, no thanks to the wandering hands of patrons. Given the more than 50 servers working the casino floors and a less than adequately staffed laundry, there's never any telling whether or not the girl before me bothered to wash the costume. I sit in one of the stained wardrobe chairs and unbraid my hair, shaking out the long rose gold waves hating the feel of them against my exposed back. The shoes are always last, painful stilettos that I'm not allowed to kick off no matter how much they pinch. I take a shallow breath, as deep as the corset will allow, eyeing myself in the cracked gilt mirror of the vanity. One of the girls told me when I first started working, in scandalized whispers, that Louis, the owner, had a black market magician spell the mirrors to be two-way. I squint at my reflection, wondering if he's watching right now. I cared once. Now I pretend not to know, like the rest of the girls. Last night, I promised the girl in the reflection. I've only said it a million times before. The dressing room door bangs open and Pearl, one of the servers, collapses into the chair next to mine in a heap of feathers. She peels her shoes off, groaning. Long day? I ask, patting a glittery balm onto my lips. One of the patrons won the jackpot, Pearl says without even opening her eyes, still slumped in the chair. Now it's my turn to groan. Most of the time, the bouncers, Louis' carefully trained enforcers, can sniff out even the faintest magic, ensuring there are never any cheaters. Not coincidentally, most of the bigger winners end up accused of magical manipulation, but even the bouncers can't prevent all wins. Louis's been a nightmare, Pearl adds, although that part is obvious. Louis hates winners, even though a big win usually means more patrons, all hoping the luck is contagious. I steal myself for the long night ahead. Adjusting my headdress, I head out onto the casino floor, grabbing a tray of drinks. All around, dead-eyed patrons drink and gamble. Faded palm trees adorn the worn and scuffed carpets. Being one of the lower-end casinos on Oasis, Louis doesn't have it in the budget to use much magic to keep patrons willingly imprisoned here, so he has to resort to more ordinary techniques. There are no windows, no clocks, nothing to distract players from their own self-destruction. Even without the added allure of magic, I've seen players spend days in the casino unaware of anything but the whir, spin, and lights of the games. Over here, darling, a voice drawls, shaking me from my thoughts. I dutifully make my way to the hanged man table, where a group of elderly women are tossing dice. Free liquor is another tactic Louis employs to keep his patrons happy and stupid enough to keep losing money. I set down the drinks wordlessly. I've learned better than to engage the patrons. Louis likes us to flirt a little, to tease but he has showgirls for that, and anyway, I don't get paid nearly enough to endure more torture than I already do. Fill him up, the woman says, not even looking my way. She's clearly on a winning streak. A stack of crystal chips sits in a pile next to her heavily adorned wrists. It's obvious she had money, once. Maybe her husband died. Maybe she lost it gambling. No one worth anything gambles at Bird of Paradise. Likely all these women are disgraced in some way, hoping to clamber back into society's good graces with someone else's money. I know the feeling. I take the shot glasses, filled to three quarters with a garish purple liquor, 
and with a snap, light them on fire. It's just a cheap bit of theatrics and carefully placed chemistry, but the patrons love it. A few of the ladies ooh, although most are focused on the woman who summoned me. From across the room, Louis's heavy brow darkens into a scowl. I'm not supposed to perform while on the clock. Just fill drinks and clean like a good little waitress. Beautiful, the woman says, downing the whole glass without even looking up. I'm dismissed. I collect the spent glasses as the women chatter and murmur, pretending I don't exist. Did you hear Raster is holding one of his parties tomorrow? One of the women says, fanning her florid face. It is abnormally hot tonight. Louis clearly tight-fisting money after his loss, skimping on air conditioning. The Seeker? I heard he's still sore about losing that headliner from the Panther. I stop, gripping one of the glasses, still warm from the pyrotechnics. I hadn't expected the news about Luke to travel so quickly. He might actually have a shot at Jester. I heard he spent more gold on his new menagerie than the Queen spent on the princess's christening. Such a show off, one of the women sighs. Isn't he single? Now, now, Cecilia, the party is by invitation only. Very exclusive, you know. The woman named Cecilia, who must be pushing 70, waggles thick eyebrows. Like that's ever stopped me. I manage to choke back my surprised laugh just in time although the noise catches the attention of one of the other women. That will be all, she says pointedly, casting a disdainful look at my costume. All hopes of a tip vanish. I take the hint. Hurrying, I pick up the tray and gracefully make my exit. Maybe if I wore something like that, Cecilia says as I swish away, and the table erupts into hoots and catcalls. I barely hear them. My mind is racing. Raster can ignore me all he likes on the streets, but if I were able to go to his party, I could make him pay attention to me. Unfortunately, there's no way I can secure an invitation to a party as exclusive as Raster's, which means I need Dell. I'm so focused I barely see the man stumbling from a chair in front of me and we collide head on. My tray falls, glasses shattering. I let out a cry of dismay, but hardly anyone looks up at the sound. Stupid girl, the man grumbles, wiping at his suit, a worn thing that does him no favors. I kneel to pick up the broken tumblers, ignoring the bite of glass in my fingers and palm. As long as I can get this cleaned up before Louis sees. What's all this? I grip the handful of shards, cringing. Your idiot server ran into me. The man slurs, swaying on his feet. Should have known it'd be you, Louis grumbles behind me. I stand up on wobbling knees, still clutching the broken tumblers. It was an accident. Sir, I do apologize, Louis says, talking right over me, using the stuffy voice he saves for patrons. Allow me to assist you in cleaning that up. He snaps his fingers at me and, confused, I hand him the sodden rag I've used to wipe up the mess. Bits of glass cling to it, and it's stained purple. Louis's eyes roll heavenward as though I'm the biggest fool there ever was. A clean one, if you please. I scramble to the bar, dumping the tray of broken glass at the bartender, who casts me a bewildered look. Grabbing a pile of clean cloths, I hand them to Louis, who snatches them away without even looking at me. He daubs uselessly at the man's lapels, the giant blotch of purple refusing to budge. It's ruined, the man says, lamenting. My best suit. I can see the way Louis's teeth grind as he wipes so hard at the stain bits of cloth scrape off. There's a laundress in town, I pipe in tentatively. Magical stain removal. Quiet, you, Louis growls. His face smooths as he turns to the patron. We'll replace the suit. The man's face grows shrewd. And you'll throw in a free round of dead man's bluff? Louis' jaw works. Of course. 
The man shambles off, pleased. I know better than to be relieved, though, and sure enough, as soon as he's out of sight, Louis turns on me. Third offense in less than a month, he snaps, shoving the cloth back at me. You know what that means. I do know what that means. Louis has been threatening to fire me for months. Outrage blooms in my chest. It wasn't my fault. This time anyway. Not my problem, Louis says, bustling off in the direction of the game machines. I follow him, limping, a shard of glass burrowed deep in one toe. What about my room? I get half my meager salary and dust, and the other half pays for one of Louis's dingy rooms. Without that, I'd be homeless. Every bit of dust you earned tonight is going towards damages, Louis growls, then plasters on a large fake smile for a table of patrons. Who's feeling lucky tonight? We had a deal. Louis's faux smile becomes bared teeth as he turns to face me. A deal that was conditional on you remaining an employee. With a snap, one of the bouncers slides in between us. The man is large, brutish, lacking the subtlety of the shipwreck's bouncers. Two meaty hands clasp in front of a garish suit covered in flamingos. Escort her out. I shrug away from the bouncer's reach. I'll walk myself out, thanks. Leave the costume in the laundry room. Cheap pig. Fine, I snap, although I have no intention of doing so. I stomp back to the dressing room, livid. Thankfully, it's empty, and there are no witnesses as I throw the headdress as hard as I can at the mirror. To my great disappointment, the glass stays stubbornly whole, although the headdress cracks. I flop into one of the chairs, listening to the throbbing of my own heart in my ears. This is the fourth job I've lost in three months. As bosses go, Louie isn't even the worst around. Girls younger than me have been forced into showgirl jobs at other, seedier casinos. And although Louie is far from perfect, the only thing he allows underage girls to do is serve. I'm not going to find a better job than this one. I stare at my red-rimmed eyes, my face lined with exhaustion too great for my 17 years. If my father hadn't killed the king, I'd be training to inherit his magic right now, not slaving away at a minimum wage job. My father's magic should have been mine. But my father was as selfish in death as he was in life. And when they took his head, he took his magic with him to wherever comes after. There's only one way to get back everything I've lost. I have to win the position of jester. As the queen's hand-selected entertainer, I'll be the most sought-after show in the kingdom, magic or no. The highest-ranked magician in the world. With fame like that, no one, not even Luke, will be able to use my past against me again. I've wasted enough time in jobs like this going nowhere. I stare at the girl in the reflection, the one I've lied to so many times. Last night, I tell her, and this time I mean it. I've got a party to go to. Chapter Three The High Judge is tired. More than tired, he is exhausted, bone deep. The current case appears beyond even his abilities. He knows that somewhere there's an answer, if only he could find it. If only he wasn't so bloody tired. He is face down in his book, drool blossoming on the last words he read when the door creaks open. The high judge awakens with a jolt. What is it? The girl, his second wife's daughter, peers in at him. Were you sleeping, my lord? What is it? He repeats, using a handkerchief to blot at the spit-smeared words. Quickly now, I'm very busy. I learned a trick, a special one for you, Papa. The high judge doesn't bother suppressing the sigh that whooshes out of him. Where is Hattie? The girl's nursemaid seemed to lose track of her charge more often than not. He would have to fire her. The girl shrugs, undeterred. Eager, she rocks on her heels back and forth. The high judge can feel the beginnings of a migraine throbbing at his temples. I don't have time for tricks. 
the high judge growls, quickly losing patience at the interruption. There is so much that must be done, and yet, here he is playing nursemaid. Hattie, where is that infernal woman? I'll take care of her father. His oldest son, his pride, kneels at the girl's side. Father is busy. Let's show Hattie your trick. The girl's face dissolves into a pout. Hattie is stupid. No, no, his son croons, taking the girl's hand. The high judge has always felt that his son is too soft with the girl. He shoots a warning look at the boy, who straightens instantly, still holding the girl's hand. Come, Lisette, father is too busy, and that is that. But it's for Papa. The girl's sobs trail after her into the hallway. The high judge rubs at his temples until the door finally shuts with a blessed click. The son wipes tears from his half-sister's face. Show me your trick, Miss Liss. You know how much I love seeing your magic. The girl brightens at the word magic despite the snot smeared across her face. It's not real magic, she confides in a whisper. That's okay, the boy whispers back. As long as it makes people happy, it's real. Giving him a watery smile, the girl takes a deep breath. Little face creased in concentration. She pulls a marble from one of the pockets of her pinafore. One of his, the boy realizes with amusement. Spinning in her palm, the glass orb catches the light from the hall sconces. The boy finds himself leaning in. It spins until she claps one tiny palm on top. Now say the magic word, she instructs him. Hattie's bloomers. Not that one, the little girl says, dissolving into giggles. It's Roland. Their father's name. Roland, the boy repeats obediently. Now watch. Lifting her palm, the girl reveals not a marble, but a gold coin. One from their father's prized collection. That is a wonderful trick, the boy says solemnly, applauding. But does father know you took one of his special coins for your trick? The girl's eyes drop. I wanted to surprise him. You know, Liz, the boy searches for the right words. Papa doesn't appreciate magic like you and I do. Perhaps you should just show Hattie and I your tricks from now on. The girl's lower lip juts out, the way it always does before she does something she's not supposed to. Stubborn as a baby goat, the boy thinks fondly. I'll find a trick that impresses him, she vows, and the boy can't help but laugh. If anyone can, it's you, Miss Liss. Now let's get that coin back in father's study before he realizes it's missing. Chapter Four after spending the night on the floor of the shared room of four showgirls who took pity on me, my neck aches and my eyes are gritty, but my resolve has never been clearer. It's not hard to find Dell. Even though it's only mid-morning, his bottom is already firmly planted in front of one of the gambling machines at the Palm, frittering away his inheritance. He doesn't even look up when I tap him on the shoulder. Yes, I'll take two more, he says absently, eyes glazed. Get a hold of yourself, Dell. I respond, disgusted. He blinks, taking me in. Lisette, why, how lovely to see you. To what do I owe the pleasure? I ignore his eyes raking over my outfit. I've foregone my usual all-black ensemble for something I knew Dell would appreciate. The emerald-colored dress is tied at the bodice, flowing in the skirts. Although I enjoy pretty dresses as much as the next girl, it seems a waste to use this one on Dell. I try not to cringe as his gaze stops at my cleavage. I need your help, I say, hating the bitter taste of the words in my mouth. That gets his attention. The game behind him is forgotten. You have no idea how long I've waited to hear you say those words, he sighs, standing up and embracing me. I stiffen as he buries his head into my shoulder. Dell is a good foot shorter than I am, although he tries to cover up the fact with heeled boots and pomposity. 
I shove him away as gently as I can. Do you know Raster Macmillan? I ask, trying in vain to steal his attention away from my décolletage. Del Preens. Of course. Esteemed seeker, heir to a fortune, debonair playboy. We have a lot in common. It's a struggle not to roll my eyes. Then surely you know about his party tonight? I hold my breath. The odds are 50-50 that Dell's family money is enough to score him an automatic invite, his reputation as a bona fide idiot notwithstanding. He casts me a wounded look. How can you even ask? Of course I'm invited, he says, offended. Now I don't even have to force a smile. Can you get me in? The gleam in Dell's eye turns appraising. For once in his life, he has the upper hand. Well, well. Little Lisette is finally chasing me. What an interesting turn of events. I have no interest in playing this game. Will you bring me or not? Dell smirks. Perhaps? What's in it for me? I spread my arms wide, letting him take me in. I even did my hair the way he likes it, tied low in a chignon. Me, as your date. I choke a little on the word and hope he doesn't notice. He does, his expression sours. I have plenty of women interested in being my date, he says peevish, brushing invisible lint from his pressed suit. Everything about Dell screams new money, from his boorish attitude down to his constant overdressing. No one wears a suit that nice this early in the morning, unless they're on their way to a party. I reconsider. As Oasis's premier party boy, he very well could be on his way to a party. I bite back the snarky response that lingers on my tongue. Hating myself, I lean in, running a finger along his opal cufflinks. His eyes track my every move, pupils dilated. Del, I breathe, watching his own breath hitch. I'll do anything. I won't, but he doesn't know that. I go in for the kill, let my lips brush his ear. He shudders. Please take me. He doesn't miss the double meaning. Yes, yes, of course, yes, he babbles. I smile, pleased. Wonderful, I say, pushing him away. He leans against the machine as if dazed. Pick me up at 8.45 sharp. I leave him there, glassy-eyed. The only problem with going to a party I'm too poor to be invited to is that I have nothing proper to wear. I pick through my meager collection of clothes, currently stuffed in a beat-up suitcase. The worn costume I don for performances, my regular day clothes, all black, and a few day dresses, cheap and gaudy. The dress I wore to seduce Dell is the nicest thing I own, and it's far too tame for a party thrown by Raster. I tap my teeth with a finger. The costume is just as important as the show, and I have nothing fitting to wear which is how I find myself backstage at the Bleached Skull, a Cirque-style show. I wander through the knot of performers hastily preparing for the next show, passing several girls in leotards and a woman with her legs wrapped around her head. No one looks twice at me. Costumes are everywhere, tossed over chairs, thrown in heaps on the floor, adopting the stressed-out expression of the other performers I rifle through a wardrobe rack looking for anything suitable. The costumes are lavish, extraordinary. I find one dress pinned with delicate, translucent wings taller than me. I'm sorely tempted. But then I picture getting caught in a doorway and reluctantly set it back with the rest. Fur, jewels, feathers, scales, gilt. There are a million different outfits, but none of them are quite right. I need something unforgettable. I pull out a stiff velvet dress, hold it to myself in front of the mirror. I look like a dead duchess, and the entire atrocity is covered in cat hair. Sneezing, I replace the velvet dress and pull out a heavy lace one instead. For a moment, I'm excited. The gown is gorgeous, intricate flowers worked into the luxurious red lace. It even has pockets. Unfortunately, it's more than a little too big for me and would drape like a wilted rose on my frame. I'm about to put it back when something in the pocket shifts, clinking. 
Reaching in, I remove a tiny glass vial. Inside, pearlescent pink beads knock gently against one another, and my eyes widen. If I'm not mistaken, it's a powerful love imitator known as Euphoria. I've seen tourists with vials of the stuff, eager to enchant their intended for an evening. It's illegal everywhere but Oasis. After a high-profile case where a count's daughter turned up murdered, euphoria in her blood. It's also very expensive, and I have no doubt it'll come in handy. Pocketing the little vial, I reach back into the waves of fabric on the rack. My fingers snag on a strand of gold. Pushing aside curtains of silk and crushed velvet, I reach for the dress, so slight it's almost hidden. When I finally see it, I can't help the gasp that escapes. It's easily the most beautiful dress I've ever seen. It looks like molten gold, shimmering strands melted into the form of a gown. And I realize belatedly holding it up, it shows quite a lot of skin. Grimacing, I recall the promises I made to Dell this morning. Not that I'm going to let him ruin this dress. Shedding my own clothes, I slide the dress on, relieved by how well it fits, clinging and molding to my body. The metal curves down my spine, framing the flawless skin beneath. There is no way Raster is going to forget who I am after seeing me in this dress. I can't bleeding stand, aristocrats, Dell mutters from my elbow. Tell me again why we're here. Aren't you considered an aristocrat? I ask, barely listening to his griping as I take in the opulence around me. Hardly, Dell says. I've got better blood than these inbred fools, and you'd never catch me throwing one of these ridiculous garden parties just for the chance to show off my wealth. It's a surprising amount of scorn from someone who is wearing not one, but three diamond-encrusted pocket watches dripping from his Rodolphe-tailored suit. He's not wrong, though. Raster certainly does know how to throw a party. Everywhere, lush, exotic flowers are in full bloom, even though we're in the middle of the desert. No doubt the exorbitant work of garden magicians. The air is heady with their scents. It's pleasant, but after a while my head spins with the richness. A drink, Mr. Fredrickson, madam. A shimmering platter appears near my elbow, foisted by a straight-backed waiter. He's young, handsome, and bland, like most of the guests at these parties. I clear my throat. Mirage. I don't know why I bother correcting him. To him, I am no one. To everyone here, I am no one, other than Dell's date for the night. I'd give anything for them to know my name. No, no, unfortunately, the lady must decline. Dell chuckles, reaching past me for one of the thimble-sized glasses. I smile tightly at the waiter who betrays only the barest of curiosity in his light eyes before bowing and edging away. Dell pinches the tiny glass between his forefinger and thumb and tosses back the contents, hardly more than a swallow. Elation lights up his features as the drink takes effect. Bet you're glad you're of age, I say, trying not to let the hint of bitterness at the back of my throat creep into my tone. Dell smirks. Thirsty, dear. Shut up. Why are we here? Dell asks again tapping his long nails against the glass, resuming his usual bored expression. I ignore him and pretend to be fascinated with my surroundings. It's not difficult. New wonders glitter everywhere I turn. There, a devastatingly lovely woman draped in nothing but jewels spins lazily in the air, suspended from a palm. Here, a group laughs as the flowers they feast on turn their heads into bubbles that pop with a shower of sparkles only to grow back in an instant. Everywhere more wealth than I've been around in years. Although this dress is one of the finest I've ever worn and I'm on the arm of one of the wealthiest men in Oasis, I forget it all in an instant at the sight of so much affluence and finery. All I want, although I'd never tell Dell, is to be accepted by these rich fools, to be one of them. And for one night I can pretend to, even if it means Dell is my date for the evening. What are these? I ask, picking up what appears to be a glass orb at my feet, more in an effort to distract Dell than actual curiosity. Dell shrugs, 
nibbling at a platter of cheeses and berries. I half expect it to pop at my touch. The glass is thin, delicate, and shimmers just like the surface of a soap bubble. Del, look, there's something inside. Del sets down his cheese with a great sigh and takes the bubble from me, leaving greasy fingerprints on the surface. Typical, he says, handing the orb back. Is it real? I ask, staring in disbelief at the glittering sapphire ring with a stone the size of my knuckle winking in the light of the moon. What did I tell you? Dell asks around a mouthful of cheese. Any excuse for these opulent wastrels to show off? Can we take it? I hardly dare to ask. Around me, the rest of the guests ignore the hundreds of glass orbs dotting the lawns, unaware of or simply unimpressed with the offerings inside. I expect that's Raster's idea of a party favor, Dell says, rolling his eyes. You'd offend him if you didn't take one. But no one else is taking them. I don't want to be the only one. I trail off, trying hard to ignore the gem twinkling up at me. Suit yourself, Dell shrugs, snatching a tart of some kind from another waiter. Maybe I'll just hold on to it, I say. I don't know what kind of etiquette applies to something like this, and I'd rather not be the first one to try. Faint strains of string music drift across the lawn. Around us, couples swirl in sweeping circles. I watch, entranced. From his partner's arms, an elegant silver-haired boy, probably old money, catches my eye. I feel my breath hitch as the faintest of smiles flashes across his face. Please come ask me to dance. Please, please, please. Try some of this, Dell says, holding out what looks like a giant shrimp garnished with a slice of lime, effectively ruining the spell between me and the beautiful boy. He dances away with hardly another glance in my direction. Another reminder that I'll never be one of them. Suppressing a sigh, I wave Dell's offering away. A tinkling of glass jerks me out of my spell. What was that? I ask, but I already know the answer. Glittering shards of glass reflect the moonlight from near the feet of a handsome couple. Smiling, the man lifts a heavy gold and emerald necklace from the sparkling shattered orb and fastens it around his maiden's neck. Several of the other guests whistle and cheer as the maiden preens, the necklace a magnificent collar on her waspish neck. Crashes shatter the dreamy night as more gentlemen follow the initiative of the first gifting their ladies with everything from raw rubies the size of my fist to thick strands of creamy pearls to handfuls of tiny, perfect diamonds. My fingers tighten around my own orb, still whole. I glance at it, admiring the gleam of its surface, the dark, almost black of the sapphire inside. Now it won't seem odd if I break it. I'll just be another reveler. The smashing of glass is almost continuous now, as more and more of the guests expose the glittering contents of the orbs. A waiter is shoved to the side as the orb near his feet is discovered, the guest who found it knocking the server over in his haste to grab it before someone else does. The plates on the server's tray fall and smash in quick succession. One woman lets out a cry as the delicate glass from a broken orb slices her fingers. Suddenly, my orb is snatched from my hands. Hey! I manage to grab the arm of the thief, a petite woman in a poofy ball gown that seems to swallow her up. How dare you? Unhand me at once, thief! The woman cries out loudly, attracting the attention of everyone around us. I drop her arm, surprised. Now, this seems a little more like something that Raster might like, Dell says, surveying the chaos unfolding before us. My ring! I cry as the woman is swallowed into the throngs of revelers. Dell waves a hand lazily. I can get you much better than that cheap trinket. I grit my teeth at his nonchalance. That ring could have paid for room and board for several months at least. That's why you're here, I remind myself. If I can impress Raster, I won't need to pawn off valuables to find a cheap place to sleep. I gust a sigh. The party has lost some of its enchantment for me. Could we meet the host now? Dell's face closes off. 
There's plenty to do with me. What do you need to meet that scoundrel for? Don't tell me you're jealous, I say, groaning. It just feels like you're using me is all, Del pouts, for my good looks and my connections. It takes every ounce of patience I have not to throttle, Del. You forgot your money. Del's outraged look is almost worth it. I'm joking, I'm joking, I say, looping my arm through his, which seems to placate him more than my words do. I'm just curious about the man behind the party is all. Del calms, but I do catch a muttered, gaudy prant, and I know better than to push the subject. Although I'm desperate to meet Raster and convince him to see my show, I can't risk upsetting Del. Without him, I'm nothing more than a homeless showgirl in a borrowed dress. I can only hope we run into Raster by chance. After all, it is his party. I steer Del toward the menagerie. Raster owns an impressive number of exotic animals, including three elephants, a jaguar, and a 30-foot boa constrictor. But the true jewel of his collection is the rare albino winter grizzly. It's rumored to be both blind and lethal. The menagerie is designed to be an immersive experience. Cages are cleverly concealed using magic, so that the stroll through the humid forest habitat feels like an actual stroll through the jungles of Sumeran. We pass an open tank of piranhas, low enough that a careless partygoer could lose an arm leaning too closely to look. They swarm and thrash as we pass, mouths agape. I jump as the boa makes its appearance, bands of bright yellow wrapped around the thick trunk of a tree. Without meaning to, I think of Luke. No matter how important he thinks he is, I'm the one at Raster's party, while he's devil knows where but being here means nothing if I don't find Raster. It's hot in the menagerie. My hair sticks to my neck. It's almost a relief to enter the next exhibit, although the temperature drops at an alarming rate. Bits of snow gust into my eyes, which I blink away in surprise. I haven't seen snow on Oasis ever. The magical upkeep of the menagerie must cost Raster a fortune. Whereas the rest of the menagerie is built to imitate a jungle climb more suited to the desert of Oasis, this room is a frozen tundra. My skimpy dress is highly inadequate against the freezing wind and snow, and I shiver uncontrollably. Del finally tears his eyes away from the wasteland and notices my state. Good heavens, you're freezing. Come, the elephants are just past this room. He tugs on my arm but I've stopped, frozen, not because of the cold, but because of the man standing several feet away from us. He's holding court with a lively group. Even from where we are, I don't miss the glint of the seeker pin on his lapel. Is that him, Raster? I ask Dell in an undertone. He follows my gaze and rolls his eyes. The very same. Let's go meet him. I say, suddenly ignorant of the fact that I can't feel my own face anymore. You can't just meet him, Dell says, grabbing hold of my arm. I almost stumble in a snowdrift, my feet two frozen stumps. He doesn't let just anyone into his inner circle. He has to talk to you. You don't talk to him. I gape helplessly at the man who has been my target all night. So close I could shout and he'd look up. Only I'm not allowed to speak to him? Unacceptable. Lisette, how charming. I scowl as Luke, cloaked in furs and the tightest leather trousers I have ever seen, breaks away from Raster's group and strides toward us. It's Mirage, I grit out. Right, my apologies, Luke says, brushing a speck of snow off his fine coat. I shiver as the snow layers into my hair as fine as powdered sugar. A fitting stage name. The only thing more disappointing than finding hot sand when you're dying of thirst might be your show. I bristle, but it's Dell who steps in, eager to be my champion. Tight enough pants, mate? Like what you see? Luke asks, not even bothering to look up from his heavy gold pocket watch. Dell splutters something incoherent in response as I try not to roll my eyes. Luke tucks his hands into his pants and takes me in. Blood heats my cheeks. 
Why, Liz, you look good enough to eat. I open my mouth to retort, but it's Dell's voice that responds yet again. Do not address the woman so informally, my good man. One arm snakes around my shoulders, drawing me possessively toward him. I really wish he'd stop doing that. I duck out from under his claustrophobic grip, only regretting the loss of warmth from his heavy overcoat. I rather think she liked it, Luke says lightly, one eyebrow raised in challenge. Dell's hand goes to his sword, a fancy, useless thing more suited to ceremony than actual combat. Oh, devils, if Dell decides to challenge him for my honor. Of course she didn't. Dell snaps, glancing towards me for reassurance. Right, Lisette? I can speak for myself, thank you. Both men look at me as though they'd forgotten I was there. I suck in a breath. As usual, Luke has distracted me from my true purpose. I turn back to Raster's group, now clustered in front of the empty habitat. Luke follows my gaze. You'll never get his attention. He's standing so close. I can feel the heat coming off his body in waves. I tighten my grip on the frozen wall. Where's your pet, Ras? One of the men draws. Raster surveys the tundra carelessly. Must be hunting. Several of the party goers let out disappointed murmurs. However, Raster says, reaching into one of his trouser pockets and pulling out what looks like a tiny gold dog whistle. I think I can get his attention. Holding my breath, I watch as he places the whistle to his lips, the gold winking in the swirling snow. Three sharp notes pierce the empty wasteland. For a moment, it's completely silent all the guests watching the horizon expectantly as the snow blankets the ground. But nothing appears. Raster shrugs and replaces the whistle. Who knows where the beast is off to? Perhaps we'll see him later. He and the group amble forward as if to leave. Luke smirks and throws a mock salute at me, close behind the others. Dell's hand on my arm is a reminder of the cost I've paid to get here tonight. And after all that, I can't very well just let Raster walk away. The vial of euphoria burns against my hip, the only warm spot on my body. The vial. If I can get the grizzly over here and do it in style, I'm certain I'll finally have Raster's undivided attention. And with a spell as powerful as euphoria, what have I to fear from a blind bear? Staggering on frozen legs, very aware that I could lose my toes or worse tonight, I make my way to the glass separating us from the bear's habitat. I can just make out the edges of the enchanted glass, blurred unless I stare at them exactly right. The top is barely a foot above my head, low enough that I can reach. Thanking the stars, I wrap my numb and clumsy finger around it. From behind me, Dell lets out a cry of shock. More people have started shouting but I hardly hear them as I scramble up the glass wall slipping on the icy surface. It's a struggle to pull myself up over the wall, but once I do, it's an easy drop into the habitat below. I come down on a patch of ice and my ankle crumples beneath me. I chide myself for not sticking the landing. Pulling myself up, hoping to regain some semblance of grace, I realize the entire habitat has gone deathly silent. Only the wind speaks muttering as it unravels my fine updo, casting tendrils of hair about my face. A huffing from my left startles me. Hot, stinking breath washes over my face. I look up, shaking all over, the breath catching in my throat. Covered in shaggy white fur, the beast stares at me, unseeing, with colorless eyes. Panting, jaws agape, Rows of teeth glint dully in the light reflected off the snow. Ropes of saliva glisten as they dangle from its mouth. So fast and so quiet, I never even heard it coming. Whatever ability sight might have granted it, the great bear more than makes up for in speed and stealth. There's no way I can outrun this creature if things get dicey. It occurs to me then that it's highly likely I've made a huge mistake. Stay still. Raster's voice breaks through the silence. 
The bear's head jerks toward the sound, nose twitching. If you run, you're dead. My heart feels like it's throbbing inside me. Straightening my back, I hold out a hand, willing my heart to calm, steadying my breath. The bear sniffs my extended fingers and then roars, a sound that nearly knocks me off my feet. Letting loose a growl that sends my entire body quaking, the bear pulls itself up on its hind legs, towering over me. I need the vial, but my fingers are numb, clumsy. It was right here, I think, but my fingers grasp only my frozen dress. The vial is gone. I'm going to die. But before I can process the thought, someone knocks into me hard. The wind gusts from my lungs as I hit the ice. I scramble to my feet only to see someone between me and the bear, Luke. Never fear, madam, Luke says, ducking right as the bear swipes an enormous paw in his direction. He even has the nerve to smirk at me. One quick quirk of his lips before the bear snaps its jaws right near his ear, and he's off again. He and the bear dance, slipping and dodging on the ice. The bear is fast, but Luke is smaller and lighter on his feet. The bear lets out a frustrated roar as Luke slips out of arm's reach again. He twists right into the bear's face, and to everyone's horror, pats it on the nose. Sleep, he croons. And the big thing blinks once, as if bemused, and then topples, the impact shaking the ground like a fallen tree. Luke stands there, chest heaving. The sound of clapping makes me jump. I turn to see Raster, slamming his hands together as though he's never seen anything better in his life. One by one, the other guests join him until the sound is deafening. Like a flower turned toward the sun, Luke basks in the applause, even allowing himself a silly bow. I can't believe my eyes. That idiot stole my show again. Before I can stop him, he scoops me into his arms. I hiss as the ice on my dress presses against my frozen skin. With hardly any effort, he carries me through the habitat door Raster has unlocked for us both. Are you all right? He asks loudly for the crowd's benefit. Always a showman. But two can play that game. I'm fine, I say, forcing a saccharine smile. Wrapping my arms around his neck, batting my eyes up at him, I tug him down to me. He leans in. And I'll be sure to repay the favor. Luke doesn't miss the threat in my tone. He straightens up, all traces of congeniality gone, and drops me. I land in a heap, a startled oof escaping me. Oh dear, clumsy me, he says, smirking as he extends a hand. Not the gratitude I expected for saving your life. I swat his hand away, pushing myself to my feet. I had it under control. Did you? Luke asks, eyebrow raised. Because from where I was standing, you were seconds away from being eaten by a giant blind bear. I had a plan, I grumble, jamming my frozen fingertips into my armpits. My entire body feels like a block of ice. Luke considers me, and with a whirl of red, drapes his coat over my shoulders. I start to protest, but it's deliciously warm, and I'm dangerously close to hypothermia. Oh, you mean this? Luke says, inspecting a tiny glinting vial he seemed to pull from midair, the euphoria. I did wonder who you planned to use it on, although I have to say I never expected you to choose a bear for your paramour. I lunge, but he dangles it just out of reach. Curse his long legs. I'll hold on to this, I think, he says, tucking it neatly into a tiny pocket of his impossibly tight trousers. You're welcome to try to get it back, of course. He smirks at the flush that heats my numb cheeks. Not that it would have done you much good in the face of a winter grizzly. You're lucky I came when I did. Are you really that afraid of a little competition? I ask, unable to stop myself. Maybe I just can't stand the thought of a bear defeating you, he says, leaning down to brush the ice crystals from my lashes. I shiver at the contact. That's my job. Ah, your boyfriend is here. Before I can correct him, Dell huffs over to us. 
excuse you, he says, jabbing Luke in the chest. Luke, who is a good foot or so taller than Dell, looks down surprised. I was on my way to rescue the maiden, my date for the evening, when you interjected yourself most impolitely. That's funny, Luke says, leaning back, the cocky grin never leaving his lips. He has the amused look of a lion being scolded by a mouse. I'm fairly certain I saw you cowering behind the Delacorte twins during the incident. Dell splutters like a hot teapot. The sheer impunity of all the nerve. Luke, you old devil. I stiffen as Raster himself approaches our little group and gives Luke a hearty slap on the back. Can't even help being brilliant, can you? Still wish I'd gotten to you before Aurora did. Devils be hanged. Luke ducks his head in a show of false modesty. I roll my eyes. I've an admitted weakness for a damsel in distress, Luke says, holding my gaze. I bare my teeth in response. This should have been my moment with Raster, and I've lost it once again to Luke. Ah, uh, yes. Raster turns to me, concerned. Are you all right, my dear? We should probably get you warmed up. Dell puts a belated arm around me and rubs my arms emphatically, the fabric of Luke's coat bunching against my skin. I shrug him away. I'm quite all right, I say, and realize it's true. Luke's coat must be enchanted because I'm warm all over, all the way down to my exposed toes. Arrogant show off. Raster nods, already turning his attention back to Luke. Of course, I'd be better if I'd had the chance to try my latest trick on your pet, I say, hoping Raster doesn't hear the obvious desperation in my tone. I hold up the tiny bottle of euphoria I managed to steal back when Raster joined us, allowing myself one tiny wink at Luke. His eyes narrow. Raster stares at it for a moment, then at me. And what exactly did you hope would happen once you used that on my grizzly? Raster asks slowly. I rather hoped he'd find me enchanting enough not to eat, I say honestly. Raster bursts into laughter, startling Dell. That's very amusing, he says, wiping away tears. I should have liked to see that very much. That old bear could use an admirer. Who did you say you are again? Lisette Schopfer. I say, curtsying prettily, even though I'm practically drowning in Luke's coat. I perform as mirage on the hangman's noose. Raster's expression turns shrewd. Ah, yes, I've heard of you. Street performer, right? My heart throbs even harder than when I was staring down the bear. I'm performing tomorrow evening, if you'd like to come. I'm sure you'd rather not waste your time. Luke says lightly, grabbing Raster's arm in an attempt to divert him. Liz performs mainly for low-class tourists, drunkards, criminals, the like. It's all I can do not to strangle him in front of Raster. I'll see if I can wander by sometime. Let's get back to the party, shall we? I'm positively frigid, Raster says, rubbing his hands together briskly. Come now, Luke, show me that trick with the drinks you did earlier. In one elegant motion, Luke tugs the coat from my shoulders as he passes. The cold envelops me instantly, but it's nowhere near as chilly as the smile Luke gives me, as sharp and cold as an icicle to the heart. Chapter Five Show me again. Edward almost laughs out loud at the sight of his sister's little lips pursed in concentration. Taking the coin, he waves it for the girl to see. Watch carefully now. Tossed into the air in a flash of gold, the coin lands with a heavy sound in the palm of his hand. With a simple maneuver, he lets the coin slide up into his sleeve. And it's gone. You forgot the magic word. Smothering his smile, Edward slaps his forehead in mock consternation. So I did. Can you say it for me? Terrificus Majesticus, the little girl intones seriously. With a flourish, Edward reveals his empty palms. Awe lights up the little girl's face. 
then just as soon, it turns to despair. I wish I had magic like you and Papa. Pity overwhelms the boy as he stares down at his half-sister's forlorn expression. Kneeling, he takes her tiny hand in his. I don't have magic yet, he confides. Papa won't give it to me until I pass a test. Her hazel eyes are round. Then how did you do that? That's a different kind of magic. A very special magic indeed, he says seriously. Would you like me to teach you? The bow pinned in her gold curls bounces as she nods eagerly, in very real danger of dislodging it. Depositing the coin into her hands, he folds her palm over it. The most important thing to remember, Miss Liz, is to make sure your audience only sees what you want them to see. When he unfolds her fingers again, the coin is gone. Using deft fingers, he plucks the coin from behind the girl's ear, as if from thin air. Show me! Laughing, he obliges, doing the trick again slowly so she can follow the coin. You see, Lisette, when you distract them well enough, even very smart people will miss the trick happening right under their nose. Chapter Six I'm enjoying a drink in the Panther Hotel lobby when a man takes the seat next to me. I recognize him instantly as Luke's second act shill. I've been expecting him. He, however, is not expecting me. I engage him in conversation easily, and he does not notice when I slip the vial of sleeping powder into his drink. He knocks back his scorpion water without even so much as a glance at the contents. He has no reason to fear being poisoned. He's only a shill. The potion is fast acting. Within minutes, he slumps onto the bar and begins snoring, loud and wet. A few nearby customers chuckle, but otherwise no one pays much attention to the poor sop. I wave over the bouncer, who drags the lug outside. Going to make sure he's still conscious, I tell the bouncer when he returns inside. He always drinks too much. I find the man in the alleyway next to a trash can still snoring. It only takes a few minutes to undress him, leaving him in his grungy underthings. I cringe as I replace my own clothes with his a flannel shirt and trousers, still uncomfortably warm. I'm grateful for his slender build, at least. The clothes are baggy, but not enough to draw undue attention. Doffing his cap, I stuff my long hair up under the brim and tug it low over my eyes. I check the man's gold pocket watch, 7.47 p.m. Tucking the watch back into a shirt pocket, I make my way to the Panthers Theater. Luke is about halfway through his show in the middle of his snake bite act, which means I'm right on time. Flashing the shill's badge at the ticket taker for the panther, I shove my way into the packed audience to the seat Luke left open for the shill, duck under the gaudy reserved sign, and make myself comfortable. On stage, Luke fondles a snake, the very same one he taunted me with. As I'm sure you're all aware, the Yan Poor Cobra is the most venomous snake in the world, Luke says lazily as the snake twines up his arm. His eyes are lidded, and he looks half reptile himself. A single drop of Yan Poor venom is enough to kill a grown man 70 times over. With a snap of his fingers, the snake lashes, sinking two glinting fangs right into Luke's carotid artery. His body seizes. Frothing and convulsing, he collapses. Forgotten, the snake drops and slithers off stage, where one of the handlers shuts it tight in a cage. Oh my! One of the ladies next to me fans herself rapidly. Do you think it's real? It's real, all right. Every performance, just for the sake of a few extra claps, Luke allows a snake to inject him with one of the deadliest poisons known to man. Checking the pocket watch, I stifle a yawn. Luke may seem flashy, but he's kind of a one-trick pony once you know what to look for. A man, another of Luke's shills, hops on stage feigning concern. Placing a hand on Luke's chest, the man feels for a beat. Sir, he says tentatively. Are you all right? Luke's tremor stills. The man's face goes pale. Someone help, I think he's dead. The audience gasps collectively. 
But of course, no one moves to help. They're still waiting for the ending, the big reveal. I think of Harrison Montgomery, who died on stage to riotous applause after his act went wrong. Nobody knew his death was real until hours later when he was found face down in a puddle of his own blood. Luke shudders violently and then jolts upright, the veins in his neck straining. As he holds up a glass vial in one shaking hand, the two puncture marks on his neck begin to weep a hissing green liquid. Sweat beads on his face as he forces the venom out of his body. A final quivering drop lands in the vial, and with a great effort, he corks it and holds it up to the audience in triumph. The clapping is deafening. His face is wan and he looks on the verge of collapsing again, but the applause seems to sustain him. I have died on stage once already tonight, and now I will face death yet again. From his pocket, he removes a tiny silver pistol. This next act seems dramatic, but it's mostly filler while Luke recovers from the snake venom. There's no magic involved, only some clever sleight of hand, which, as it just so happens, is my specialty. Could I have a volunteer, please? I raise a hand, ducking my head so he can't see my face. The pheasant feather placed jauntily in the brim is more than a fashion accessory. It stands out in a crowd, making it easy for Luke to find his prearranged plants. Not all performers use plants or stagehands disguised as regular audience members, but Luke's show depends on them. Yes, you, in the hat. I make my way on stage, careful not to make eye contact, head down. Luke doesn't pay me any attention anyway. He's far too focused on his audience. Would you please inspect this pistol, my good man? Make sure it's in working order? Pretending to inspect the pistol, I pop several of the rounds out and show them to the audience, per Luke's normal routine. After a good sweep, I replace the rounds. They're heavy in my hand. No fakes here. Now, just to make sure everything's working as it should, why don't you take a shot at the target just over there? Aiming carefully at the target, I pop off a shot. It hits just left of the bullseye, and I don't miss the rays of Luke's eyebrow. His normal shill is something of a wild shot, and it usually makes for a good bit of comedy in the routine. Before he can scrutinize me too closely, I wave to the audience turning away from him. Well done, what a lucky shot, Luke says, doing his best to disguise his surprise. As you can see, the pistol is real and in fine working order. For as long as man has existed, he has feared death. That's my cue. While the audience's attention is on Luke, I eject the remaining rounds into my pocket and reload the gun with the blanks. Even blanks can be harmful if mismanaged, but they won't kill him. At least I don't think they will. Anyway, the point isn't to kill Luke. The point is to steal the spotlight back, the way he stole it from me at Raster's party. Humiliate him the way he humiliated me. And tonight I shall face death not once, but twice as I allow this man to shoot me right in the mouth. The bullet catch is an old trick, although every magician does it a little bit differently. After being tied up to ensure he won't have any second thoughts, Luke has his man stand 20 feet away and shoot. Once the gun has gone off, Luke reveals the hidden round in his mouth. It's a bit cheap, but it buys him the time he needs to recover for his next act. I stand at the mark Luke has drawn on stage and consider the gun in my hand. It's a pretty thing, with whorls of silver embellishments that look like roses on the grip and slide. It's clearly an antique. I hope Luke's trust in it is not misplaced. Go ahead then, Luke calls from across the stage. Shoot. Luke has his method for the bullet catch, and I have mine. Removing the hat, I shake out my rose gold hair, watching with satisfaction at the way Luke's eyes bug from across the stage as he finally sees me. Sorry, everyone, but this is not your usual bullet catch. This is a good old fashioned shootout. Strolling past Luke's mark, a streak of charcoal on the stage, I stride right up to where he's bound. He struggles against his bindings, but his assistant, excuse me, my, assistant, 
made sure the ropes were tied good and tight. Luke stares up at me completely at my mercy. His amber eyes are wary, but to his credit, he doesn't say a word. Look at that, he's sweating bullets. I jeer to the crowd's delight. Luke's eyes dart to the gun I'm twirling. Oh, don't worry, I say, winking at him. I made sure all the rounds were live, just as you asked. Turning back to the audience, I survey the gun as though displeased. The bullet catch is so dull, though, isn't it? Hardly impressive, catching a bullet from 20 feet away. Where's the thrill in that? Luke shakes his head at me almost imperceptibly. I throw him my most dangerous smile in return. And since the devil here is a world-class magician, I've no doubt he can handle the danger. Running a finger along his full lower lip, I gently pry open his mouth and wrap it around the end of the gun. His eyes are desperate, pleading. I lean in close so only he can hear. Don't ever interrupt my show again. And then I shoot. Luke's head snaps back. The cartridge is only a blank, but the force from the gun is still enough to give him a good bit of whiplash. The explosion would be lethal to anyone else, bullet or no. With Luke, it's just a loud annoyance thanks to his ability to heal himself. Slapping his head forward, I watch as he spits the concealed cartridge into the metal cup I have outstretched. It lands with a satisfying plink, spattered with Luke's blood. He glowers up at me, lips blackened from the gunpowder. I hold the cup up in triumph. The crowd roars. I live for that sound. And it's somehow even more delicious when stolen from someone else. Luke's eyes glitter as I pass, malevolent, and I know without him even saying it that he will make me pay for this little trick. But at least he knows now that if he does, I will bite back. And I have venom too. Leaving him bound, I hop lightly off the stage as stagehands rush to free him. Hands grasp at me, praise washing over me like honey as I make my way through the crowd. Well done, young lady. Fine execution of the bullet catch. Never seen anything like it. Excuse me. A man struggles up the aisle trying to reach me. Mirage. I can just make out the emerald tie and charcoal suit, a head of short, dark hair. For a moment, I'm positive it's Raster until I realize it's a woman, not a man. Roseanne, call me Rose, she says, sticking out a hand, standing in front of me with a wad of taco seeds stuffed in her cheek, spitting. Owner and manager of the theater at the Saguaro. I ignore her extended hand, looking over her shoulder, scanning the audience for Raster. A seeker, anyone else. There is no one but Roseanne, call me Rose. My heart sinks. I know the Saguaro. It's a mid-range hotel, nowhere near as grand as the Crown or Panther. Granted, it wasn't my greatest work, and I did sneak into the theater, but I still hoped it would be enough to get Raster's attention anyway. That was quite a show, Rose says, nodding at Luke, whose stagehands are still struggling with the knots in his bindings. Thank you. The words are bitter in my mouth. It's never good enough. I'm a sucker for a good rivalry. Rose admits, brushing off her suit. And I've been dying to take old Millie at the crown down a notch or two. If I were to offer you a spot in our show lineup, I expect there would be more shows like that. I'm really not interested. Of course, you'd have a shot at just or two. My head jerks up. I thought only luxury hotel performances were considered. Rose waves away the idea. Any act is considered even if those nepotistic fools at the crown are given preference. So long as you can snag a seeker, you'll get to that final show. Hope struggles inside of me, thrashing like a wet cat. On stage, Luke has finally managed to free himself and is rubbing at his chafed wrists. His wrathful expression is all the convincing I need. I could destroy him, I say, and I'd make the whole thing wildly entertaining. Rose studies me. She's older than I first realized, streaks of gray and the wiry dark hair tucked behind her ears. She breaks into a smile. I dare say you would, 
she says, sticking out her hand again. This time I take it. The shows are nightly. You'll be given a room at the Saguaro for the duration of your employment and have full access to the Saguaro's world-famous stage while there, as well as all the Saguaro Hotel's numerous amenities. I suggest you avoid the gambling tables, though. Her eyes twinkle. Of course, I'm quick to agree. Most important, don't make me regret my choice. Her voice is stern, belied by her bright smile. It's not just your reputation on the line now. It's mine, too. I won't disappoint you, I promise. Rose nods, wide smile returning. Her teeth are yellow, stained by years of pipe smoke or coffee. Welcome to the Saguaro. Luke seems like a serious enemy, but Lizette is finally having some success on her journey to Jester. She still needs a seeker to attract the attention of the queen, but how hard could that be, right? Can Lizette find someone willing to bet on her to become Jester? Can she come up with a way to defeat the impossible Luke? Or will angering Luke cost her the little progress she's made? Stay tuned to find out. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen to Jester now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. You can find Brielle Porter on social media at Briellums. And make sure you follow us at Camcat Books. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on Camcat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone, but don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. Also, check out our background episodes where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books, including interviews with the authors, editors, and other industry professionals. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet. <laughs>